Our experts in emotion interview today will be with Dr. Matthew Hurstenstein. He received his PhD from the University of California, Berkeley, and he's currently an associate professor of psychology at Day Powell University, where he directs the Touch and Emotion Laboratory. So his research uh, is conducted with students um, in three areas, including touch and the communication of emotion, as well as the prediction of emotion and emotion in infants. His work has received widespread media coverage, including NPR, The New York Times, ABC News, BBC, Scientific American Mind, and Psychology Today. So I now turn to our experts in emotion interview with Dr. Matthew Hertensein. So what I thought we could start off um, talking about is just a little bit about hearing your story of what first got you interested in the topic of emotion. Sure. I mean, really briefly, uh, the thing that really got me interested in emotion was studying babies. Um, as you might imagine, uh, emotions are the primary means of communication for infants. They don't obviously have language. Um, and so babies are really where it started uh, for me. And I still study uh, infants to this day, but I also study adults as well. So babies are really what, what got me started down the road of emotion. Fantastic. So I want to ask you now a little bit about your journey down the road of emotion and sort of some themes about some of the really exciting research that you've done in this domain. So you're well known for this really exciting and influential work on the nature of touch and emotion. So to begin, for those who may not have heard of this work, how can touch function as a mode of communication in general in human species? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, it's, it's a question that we're, we're getting the handle on, but we're, there's still a lot to learn. There are a lot of more questions than answers. Um, but, you know, we see touch in our relationships with other people, um, you know, with our kids, with our siblings that we might have, um, our intimate relationships, so it, it, it bonds us to other people. Um, touch is really important in power uh, hierarchies, so you see different uh, facets of touch being used depending on who's powerful and who's less powerful. So those differential relationships you see touch in. Um, touch increases liking of other people usually, as long as it's obviously used appropriately and in, con in proper context. Um, so we see it there. Uh, compliance is a big one. There's been a lot of research that shows that when we touch other people, when we ask them for something, or for help or something like that, touch really increases compliance. So um, a, a well-known study where a medical practitioner touches uh, his or her patient while telling them that it's important to take their, their medicine, and sure enough, the people who are touched um, take their medicine more frequently and more uh, as instructed versus the people who, in a control condition, who aren't touched. So compliance is also a big, a big deal, but what I focus on is the how touch communicates emotion in our relationships. So how can touch communicate emotions? Well, you know, there's a variety of ways we're just learning um, about this. I mean, one of the ways is, you know, there are specific receptors within the skin that are, you know, nociceptive, or another way, a fancy way of saying that is just um, induces pain pretty easily, right? So there's, so some touch is just inherently negative but then also some touch is inherently positive, right? So just in terms of the tactile receptors we have in our skin, um, how those are stimulated will influence how, what emotions we perceive through that. But a lot of it um, is potentially learning. I mean, like I uh, talked before about babies and emotion, I mean, touch is fundamental to the relationship between parents and their offspring. Um, so from almost day one, we're being touched and stroke and cuddled and all this sort of stuff, even though, by the way, it goes away um, in most of our in adolescence and our adult life, which we can have a whole other discussion about. <laughs> um, but anyway, so there's a lot of learning that goes on because mm -hmm. that, that language, so to speak, of, of touch is being taught to us early in life. And then I'm, I have no doubt that there's some sort of evolutionary underpinnings to a lot of this. Um, and, you know, we can see a lot of this, too, when we, when we study chimpanzees or whatnot. Um, so it's a kind of a combination, but teasing these things apart and understanding how they interact is sort of, you know, a future researcher's dream. 
So one really exciting thing about the work you've done in this domain is you've developed this really innovative paradigm for studying the communication of touch in a laboratory setting. And I wonder if you could share a little bit about this. Um, I know that the work we've done together has used your fantastic paradigm, and it's just such an elegant and uh, unusual way, it, some people might think, of learning uh, how we can study touch in these contexts. Yeah, I mean, actually, it's pretty deceptively simple. Um, we've done it a, a variety of different ways. The first time that we did this, we had two people um, sit across from each other at a table, and there was a barrier between the two people, um, a cloth barrier, so they couldn't see each other. They didn't know. You didn't know if a male or a female was sitting across from you. You didn't know their age. They never spoke, so you couldn't tell any of that. And then one person was randomly assigned to put their arm underneath the curtain and the other person uh, basically was told to communicate a variety of different types of emotions just on the arm. And um, the question that we're asking is how accurate are those people at perceiving those emotions? Um, and so we borrowed methodology um, from other researchers who studied the face or the voice and so this wasn't all on our own um, whatsoever. Um, and essentially we found that sure enough uh, Touch communicates these specific emotions, um, kind of like the face and the voice, although some different ones which we can talk about. Um, but you know, before we did these studies, um, some researchers tended to think that, um, not all, but some researchers tended to think that touch might communicate positive or negative emotion, but kind of nothing specific or discrete. So it's this research line. Uh, kind of debunks that idea and shows that we're actually, it touches a really sophisticated um, means by which we communicate our emotions. And did you find specific patterns of touch for distinct kinds of emotions you could say a little bit about? I wonder if people in the audience are wondering, so how does something like anger look different from love, for example? Right, that's a great question. I mean, here's here, the take-home message about, uh, about that is there is far more diversity in how we communicate uh, via touch than there are specific patterns. So we, I'm working on, we, my collaborators and I are working on coming up with quote unquote prototypes for, uh, or rough prototypes of how we might communicate distinct emotions via touch. But there's nothing, um, it's very difficult to come up with that, um, partly because the methodology is very um, rudimentary right now in terms of measuring touch. It's so, I wouldn't say easy to measure facial expressions, but there is a system out there, right, that we all know that um, I'm sure other speakers in your series will discuss. Um, but there is no such standardized system in the field of touch. So we're trying to come up with one of those so that we can better get a grasp on what exactly uh, the question you're asking. Excellent. I mean, your work on touch and emotion has also revealed some really important individual differences, right, in how we perceive, you know, this touch signal from other people, sort of what it communicates to us. And for example, I wonder if you could say a little bit, perhaps, about how men and women may differ, you know, and how they perceive or utilize touches to communicate emotions. Well, just for a second, let me back up and say that sure, in sure. our paradigm, we've that we we done both with the arm, and then mm -hmm. we've done whole body touch. Sure, um, sure. And we found that some, men and women can communicate a variety of different emotions pretty well, like fear or sadness or disgust, love, gratitude, sympathy. All of these are above chance levels that are common between both men and women. And notice, by the way, that some of these emotions are the same as what is communicated. Um, accurately in the face and the voice, but some of those emotions are different um, than the face and the voice. And I think that's a good opportunity for, for future researchers to, to kind of tackle that. Okay. So to get to your question about men and women, um, I, I really wish we wouldn't have found these differences, frankly, um, because they sort of support these stereotypes that some people have. Um, so I wish we wouldn't have found gender differences, but we did, and you know, I have to go where, where nature uh, mm -hmm. takes me. And so, we found, you know, in our in our paradigm, right, you can have a male touching a female, a female touching a male, or you can have two males, or you can have two females. So you can have every gender combination possible, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And we found the only gender combination that was unsuccessful at communicating anger were all female diets. So um, if you get two women together and you tell one to communicate anger to the other, um, they're not above chance doing that. Um, if you have a male involved, 
um, in in that grouping, um, they are able to. So so that so anger seems to be not as easy for women to communicate as as men. And then the other emotion again, I wish I didn't find these findings. So interesting. I know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one of the ones that um, we found was was sympathy. And as you might guess, um, women were much better at this than men. When you got two men together, they couldn't communicate that above mm-hmm. chance levels. Um, so again, I wish I wish I wouldn't have found those those gender differences. Um, but I, you know, we, and we can only take some guesses as to why. I mean, is it you know, evolutionary? Are, there, are the origins or evolutionary heritage in that? Um, you can look to the animal literature and, and see some of that, um, but obviously socialization um, can be playing a huge role, um, and I don't think I would want to discount that at this point either. So one other area of individual differences that I know you and I have talked a little bit about is the role of communicating and perceiving touch in emotional disorders. So for example, I know you've done some work in individuals with a history of mood disorders like mania. And I wonder if you could say a little bit about how their experience of touch and the way that they, you know, perceive touches might be different from the rest of the population. Yeah, it's a great question. So we're just beginning to get a, a beat on that. And um, one of our, our, it's a really nice finding um, that our group has actually done, is basically looking at people with people who are prone to high degrees of positive emotion. Mm-hmm. And those people are actually um, somewhat more accurate overall at perceiving these distinct emotions um, in the paradigm I discussed with you. And um, not only that, but they tend to over attribute um, positive emotions to all the touches they, they perceive from, from uh, people. So there's this over attribution of positive emotions, sort of under attribution of negative emotions. So, you know, I don't, we don't fully understand that completely, but we know that there is this individual difference that's that's coming out of the data. Um, so everything feels good, right? Everything feels good, mm-hmm. and and they're they're more accurate, which is pretty surprising in some ways, um, but maybe not another. So so yeah, so there's that individual difference. The gender is a really interesting one, and a team in London actually uh, published a paper last year, uh, maybe two years ago, um, showing that romantic relationship status influences. Um, perception of touch. So they found that um, strangers could not communicate embarrassment to each other via touch, but romantic couples could. Wow. So there's a nut. So relationship status is also seeming to play a role. So I think I think that's in the individual difference question is ripe for our investigation. So I wanted to ask you about one other theme in your work, and this has all been really interesting hearing you speak about it. Um, one other area in your work has really looked at the way that touch can be used to actually regulate or shape the emotions that people experience. And I wonder if you could say a little bit about what do you see as the most important discoveries here about how touch can actually serve a regulatory function? Well, I mean, this is that's a great question. I, and I would say, it, it, it's honestly, it's too early to really get a good sense of that. Um, I've studied that in adults and infants, um, and I, I think some of the best work has been with the infants, honestly, like using uh, touch, caregiver's touch with infants to help them understand, you know, what is good and what is bad in the world and how they should understand the world. Um, so if you introduce an object that the baby doesn't quite understand um, in front of him or her at around the age of, of one year old or whatnot, um, and you touch them positively, they'll be much more likely to approach that that toy, that object. And if you touch them sort of in a negative, abrupt manner, they're much more willing to kind of retract and, and not willing to touch that. And so you're literally influencing their perception of the objects around them, the world around them, and perhaps their emotional state during that. Um, you know, in terms of adults, um, there's been some work on that question, but honestly not a lot. Um, one of the kind of promising areas is honestly is looking at sort of this, uh, touch therapy, mm-hmm. which I'm not as involved in in my lab. Um, a woman named Tiffany Field down in Florida does a lot of this work, and she's finding there's really, really powerful effects on mood and mental state and that sort of stuff with, you know, this massage therapy or touch therapy. 
So it's, it's really great work. Really fascinating. So I mean, I know today we've talked about the role that touch can play in communicating, you know, emotions and the work that you've done showing that it can actually communicate really distinct types of emotions and can be used to sort of regulate emotions as well. So I wonder as you sort of, you know, moved in this field and really made some landmark discoveries here, where do you see the future of the field moving forward? Great question. I mean, I, I think um, a, a number of ways I can think about the top mm -hmm. of my head. Uh, Number one, looking at physiological underpinnings of all of this. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I think that's a natural question, wide open for investigation. Um, and I mean, you know, central nervous system, autonomic nervous system. Um, so I think that's wide open and we've got some work going on um, on that question. But I mean, it, it really is wide open. And obviously that work has been done for years in the face, looking at the facial expressions of emotion. Um, and some of it on the voice, um, but very little the touch. So I think that's one uh, area that's wide open. Another one is just looking at how the context of real world situations influence how touch is communicated. So a lot of it, uh, my work especially, has been done in the lab, um, but I think the next step is to take it out of the lab, look at this in the real world, have some um, more ecologically valid uh, um, procedures to use, um, to look at how touch is used to communicate emotion. So I think that's wide open. Individual differences, I still, I mean, it, even though we've discovered some individual differences in terms of um, how well people touch, how perceptions of that touch and whatnot, I think there's a lot to be discovered in that area. And then finally, um, looking at the person as a whole, right? So we can talk about touch as a modality to communicate emotions. We can talk about the face as a modality to communicate or the voice or gesture or whatnot. But how do all of these come together in the real world um, to communicate emotion? Which ones are really um, driving the communication of emotion and how do they interact with each other? Um, I, we're just beginning to get um, a sense of, of that and I think you know, in the next decade or so um, we should be making some pretty good strides in that area. So when you have students come to you asking you for advice, you know, who are thinking about embarking in this field of emotion, what kind of advice might you give them? Great question. I mean, just in general and, be, and beyond my specific area, um, I think honestly asking important questions and just really working hard to think about, you know, what you want to put your time into because our time is precious, resources are precious, and you can ask questions and answer them, but the question is, is or what, is what you're studying important? Mm -hmm. um, is it really going to make um, uh, an impact on the field? So I would answer important questions um, because I've just seen so many people ask questions that really don't amount to much or maybe a little bit, but I mean, if you're gonna spend your time, you might as well spend your time on a big question uh, or a set of big questions. So I would I would definitely give that advice. Um, it's. It's a bonus, I'd say, uh, not imperative, but a bonus if you can study things that not too many other people study. Um, I mean, having room to make some of these discoveries, um, I think, is is wonderful. Um, so you've done that, and other people we know have done that. And so I, I think studying things that not a lot of people are involved in. Maybe you don't want to be the only one, of course, but you want to want to try to study some of the things that you can make a discovery and. and help further the field. Um, another one is integrating, you know, multiple methods, I think is always a, a great um, thing in almost any field in psychology. So using physiological measures, self-report measures, behavioral measures, all of these and trying to bring them together to answer your question um, and different research designs I think is really important. And then finally, you know, when, it, when you are in graduate school or you are doing your postdoc, trying to find people that study emotion using these different tools, you know, having a great team um, so that you can really learn from the best, I think is really important too. So asking important questions, studying something that hope, ideally that nobody knows too much about, um, integrating multiple methods, and then finally finding those people that can help you learn those tools, I think are, are some of the keys to, to uh, produce, providing some good solid research in the field and moving it along. Well, thank you so much. That's excellent advice. So I just want to thank you again for joining us today, Matt. This concludes our Experts in Emotion interview with Dr. Matthew Hertenstein from DePaul University.